So again, welcome. Today's presenter is Murray Stein. He'll be going solo this time. I know sometimes he'll bring a additional speaker. Uh, he is so expert in alchemy. Yeah, we were yeah, hoping for him to at least do this introduction yeah, one uh, with him as the main presenter. Again, I will be the host. Uh, Len probably won't be joining us. You see him as a panelist up there. He was unable to make it yeah, today, uh, but I'll be the, uh, the main host. And Ryan Deegan is a technical you know, person of ours who may be adding a little bit in today as well. This is a list of countries participating. We're always delighted to have so many countries joining us you know, for these events. And today they include Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Japan, Sweden, Switzerland, and of course the United States. And we are just uh, delighted to have so many people from around the world continue to join our, our growing community. This is a 90 minutes you know, webinar. We'll end pretty close to 90 minutes. You know, Murray often has to leave around that point. If people want to have a bit of a discussion afterwards, you may go just a few minutes more. But this one will be pretty close to, uh, to 90 minutes. Uh, you can ask questions through the, uh, the email. You can send it to info at actfloryoungcenter.org. It's better, though, to use the chat feature. For all those home viewers, you'll notice you can type in questions in one of the chat boxes and send those to us. Do ask questions. We'll be breaking for questions at least once, if not you know, a couple times or so, and we'll be able to ask those directly of Murray. If you're brave, towards the end, we might open up the webcams. If somebody clicks the raise your hand button, we can actually open up your webcam. And as long as you turn down your speakers to avoid feedback, we can actually speak directly to you, which is kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. But you can always send in questions by chat or email. That is, is always one that makes sense. Do make sure that you've clicked on the right buttons. If you're a home viewer, uh, there are two choices for audio microphone and speaker, which is using the computer system, or you can dial in via telephone. Most people use the computer microphone, uh, but make sure that is clicked correctly. And don't worry about your microphones. They're always muted. Uh, we only unmute them during the question phase and only if you request, and you'll have the option to do the final unmute or not. Make sure you hit the full screen mode button on your computer. You can drag the sliders to raise or to shrink or large. Uh, enlarge the presenter or the slides. And again, there's the ask question button. Just to let people know, Lionel Corbett has agreed to do a webinar in January. We're going to take a break for December. Let people get into the holidays. But come January 8th on a Wednesday night, we are going to have Lionel Corbett out of uh, Pacifica, California. He'll be doing one on the Sacred Cauldron, which is a book that he published with the Chiron Publications not too long ago. And you'll hear more about that in the month of uh, December. We also have some limited edition red book prints. If you go to our homepage, you'll see a red banner. If you click to it, you'll see some pretty amazing prints. They are rather pricey, but they are uh, museum quality. These are prints that actually have been shown in museums. Marie and I both got a chance to look at them in Copenhagen. We were there recently, and the quality is really quite striking. So you can click through to look at those if you have a, an interest in that. Again, the Asheville Young Center homepage has a link to that. We have no commercial support uh, of any type today, no pharmaceutical industry uh, support associated in any way, and there will be an online survey which will be sent to you later. We are taping today, so please know that if you send a question, if you want it to be anonymous, don't uh, put your name in it, just say you'd like it anonymous. Uh, and if we do open up your microphone or your webcam, uh, actually, if you open it up, you'll have control over that. Um, you'll be on the recorded version of this as well. And one more piece before I introduce Murray is that today is a bit of a, a test. It's the introduction you know, seminar to alchemy that Murray has put together. Uh, we, were, we are considering doing a five to six uh, session series on alchemy. That would be once a month. It would be on a Saturday. You know, live from Zurich, the same time, 90-minute duration. And we'll have dates uh, set aside if we're able to do so. But we'd like some feedback for you today. If you like the introduction to Alchemy today and you would like to potentially enter a you know, five-month course, monthly 90-minute sessions, send me an email, kind of let me know, and Murray and I will be talking soon and finalizing the plans for that. 
personally, I think it's a wonderful idea. It should be quite exciting. Murray might speak a little bit more about that as well. We'll probably bring in some other speakers too that might do uh, different sections of that, and Murray would coordinate that out of Zurich. Most of you know Murray Stein quite well. He has done the majority of our talks at the Asheville Young Center. Uh, he is a supervising training analyst and formerly president of the International School of Analytical Psychology, Zurich, ISAP, Zurich, author of many books, uh, including The Principles of Individu Individuation and quite a few others. And of course, he resides in Switzerland. So without further ado, we will turn this over to Murray and go from there. So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, when Steve and I began discussing this uh, project, I uh, went through notes and uh, materials that I had from earlier courses and classes and uh, realized all over again how important uh, the study of alchemy was to Jung in his uh, later years. Um, Maybe just to begin this introduction uh, on, on Jung's work on alchemy, I'd like to just give you from, let's see, this, oops. Now, can we go to the next one? The stages of Jung's life. Uh, and this is a, a very uh, crude breakdown of um, Jung's life and work, but I think it's useful just to give you an overview of where uh, his work on alchemy fits into the whole picture. Um, he was born in 1875 and lived the first 20 years of his life uh, in the neighborhood, of, mostly in the neighborhood of Basel, went to school there, and then began to attend the university and studied medicine. So we could say from zero to 20, call it childhood and youth, his growing up years, uh, which he comments on quite extensively in his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Uh, the second stage of his life, which we can call early Jung, with quotation marks around Jung, um, is the, the beginning of the professional Jung, the, the uh, thinker that uh, we know so well today, who became very prominent in his own lifetime, and beginning in 1895, uh, the age of 20, going to the university in Basel, studying medicine, he began uh, his um, professional work uh, and his writing. Uh, the uh, earliest um, published works of his that we have on record are the lectures that he gave at the university to the Zofingia Club. Um, there are four or five lectures published in the series by Princeton as a supplementary volume to the collected works. Um, and there you see the young Jung grappling with psychology, with religion, with philosophy, um, and beginning to form his uh, attitudes about, uh, his intellectual attitudes about uh, all those subjects, uh, and beginning to orient himself in the world of thinkers. Um, it was a quite a precocious young man, read a lot at an early age, uh, was, had strong opinions about philosophy and religion and so on. And so from there, 1895 to 1915, what we call the early Jung, beginning at the university, and then in 1900, beginning a study of psychiatry in Zurich at the Berkowski Clinic. Um, and in this period, we have um, the beginning of his uh, professional writings in psychology, psychiatry first, and, uh, and uh, experimental psychology and his works on the word association experiment. And then he meets Freud and becomes very interested in psychoanalysis. Uh, and so in this period, uh, we include the Freudian period. This early Jung period is also the time when he got married to Emma Jung in 1902 established a family, built a house in Zurich or in Kusnacht on the lake and uh, began his private practice there, moved out of Berkholsley Clinic in 1913. Actually earlier 1909, moved into his house, began his practice there. Uh, private practice continued working at the university and teaching until about 1913. 
And then uh, the early Jung ends more or less at his age of 40, a little before, maybe 38. Uh, and then the middle Jung begins. And by the middle Jung, we'll think of him between the ages of 40 and 60, his middle life period, the middle Jung, 1915 to 1935. And this begins with the uh, famous uh, uh, confrontation with the unconscious, which turned into the Red Book eventually, and uh, the calligraphic, beautiful calligraphic pages in the Red Book and the paintings and all of that, which he finished around 1928, stopped, but uh, stopped recording uh, in the Red Book. Uh, that belongs to the middle Jung also is beginning to refer to his his type of depth psychology, not as psychoanalysis, that was Freud's word, but rather as analytical psychology and forming the Zurich School, the Psychological Club was founded in 1916. And a group of people, students gathering around him and uh, he's beginning to make his way as a teacher and forming his own ideas about depth psychology developing the theory of the archetypes, which he had started already at the end of the early period, uh, working with Freud, uh, but really going further with his uh, concept of the archetypes. And uh, also in this middle period, writing his um, really very, fun, very great work, uh, Psychological Types, published in 1921, which he summarizes almost everything he knows about psychology to that point. Um, and uh, a lot about psychodynamics, also about history, but mostly about uh, what he calls the psychology of consciousness, the psychological types. Um, and during this middle period, he also makes very important connections with other thinkers and other figures, among them Richard Wilhelm, uh, who he met in Darmstadt at the School of Wisdom in the early 1920s. Um, and out of that relationship came some very important uh, results, which we will uh, consider in a moment. Among them is introduction, serious introduction to the study of alchemy. Um, also during that period of time, he studied very much Gnosticism. Uh, he said he was looking for a connection between what he had discovered in his Red Book experiences and something in in uh, history, some, some way to anchor himself in a historical tradition. And he looked to Gnosticism first, uh, found some connections there, but couldn't make uh, a link between the end of Gnosticism and the early part of the Christian era and the present day, and would later discover that link in uh, alchemy. Uh, but he's also studied Eastern religions during this middle period quite intensively. He's very interested in Chinese philosophy and texts like the I Ching, Secret of the Golden Flower. Um, and he did uh, uh, some extensive traveling uh, during this period of time as well. Significantly, most significantly, his trip to Africa in 1925. Um, and um, as well as several trips to the United States. And uh, of course, many journeys around Europe uh, and to England, uh, one of his favorite uh, countries and, and places to visit and lecture. Well, the middle young ends, uh, we could say around 1935 and then begins the late young, 1935 to the end of his life, 1961. And at the heart of this period, really are um, uh, his works on alchemy and Christianity and what we could call the development of a new, of a new myth for Western culture. And all of that we'll touch on uh, in the course of our considerations of uh, his writings on alchemy. Now what I'm showing you here is a mandala that he uh, painted into his red book in 1928. And um, about this, he says that uh, after he had finished this, he uh, looked at it, stepped back from it, looked at it, and it had a strange Chinese feeling to him. 
felt Chinese in, in tone, atmosphere. And at that point, uh, simultaneously with, uh, synchronistically, we could say, came in the mail a package from Richard Wilhelm, which included uh, a Tibetan mandala, uh, which reminded him very much of this, and the text, The Secret of the Golden Flower. And this was a very important moment in his uh, intellectual life, in his, in his thinking and his explorations of the unconscious uh, because um, he, uh, what he found in that Chinese text, which was a, a Ch uh, Chinese alchemy text, Secret of the Golden Flower, were certain amazing parallels and um, similarities to what he had been um, working on in his own active imagination, his own inner development as recorded in the Red Book, and in the work with patients to that point. And this gave him the feeling, uh, he says, for the first time he, he broke out of his isolation, that he felt a connection to something uh, generally human, that he wasn't quite as weird and eccentric as he had feared, or other people may have said he was. Uh, what are you doing there, painting those pictures in the red book and spending so much time thinking about your active imaginations and so on? He had felt a little bit strange about all that. Uh, now he discovered that these ancient Chinese alchemists had been do doing something quite similar and that their experiences were not so different from his. And so he writes at the bottom of this picture, uh, 1928, this uh, I painted this picture at the same time that a packet from Richard Pilhelm came to me that showed me uh, this uh, um, the secret of the golden flower and a, and a Tibetan mandala. And this helped me establish a position uh, outside myself and broke through my feeling of isolation. So from that point on, Jung felt that he was in touch with a level of the of the psyche of the human mind that is general, that's common to all humanity, and that there are patterns of um, imagery, symbols, symbolism, and process that um, are not just personal to himself, but common to human beings generally. And uh, this gave him a great feeling of reassurance that he was on the track of something important because he did want to create a general psychology of the unconscious and show how that, uh, how the unconscious and the um, emergence of uh, material from the unconscious influences culture and individuals, influences the human psyche at a conscious level. Um, shortly before he had this breakthrough with Richard Wilhelm, though, as he writes in the chapter that I suggested that you all read um, uh, from Memories, Dreams, Reflections, chapter seven, The Work, um, page 202, he tells of a dream that he had a couple of years before uh, he discovered alchemy. Um, and what, he's, what, he, what he means by before I discovered alchemy uh, is uh, this contact with Chinese alchemy in 1928 and following. Um, but before, he says, before I discovered alchemy, I had a series of dreams which repeatedly dealt with the same theme. Um, and then he goes on to tell about a dream in which he is in his house, it's a large house, and he discovers another wing or annex, he says, which was strange to him. Each time I would wonder in my dream, why I did not know this house. This isn't an unusual dream. Many people have this dream in which they open a door and they discover a whole other section of the house that they didn't know existed before, or they go into the basement and find another level or uh, um, room or series of rooms that they didn't know existed. So it's a dream of that kind. And he had this dream several times. Um, and, and then he says, finally came a, a dream in which I reached the other wing. So 
you could actually get into it. I discovered a wonderful library there dating from the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, and in that library, he saw large, flat, fat folio volumes bound in pigskin. Among them were a number of books embellished with copper gravings of a strange character. And this fascinated him, this library fascinated him, he said. In the dream I was conscious only of the fascination exerted by them and by the entire library. It was a collection of medieval in, uh, inco inconabula and 16th century prints. Um, so this was just a couple of years before he discovered uh, Chinese alchemy. And I want to show you the next picture. I can get it up. <laughs> this isn't so easy to work this thing. Oops, I don't want that picture. Back one. Back, 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 back. There. Um, he says, the unknown wing of the house was a part of my personality, an aspect of myself. It represented something that belonged to me, but of which I was not yet conscious. It was especially the library referred to, uh, it was it and especially the library referred to alchemy of which I was ignorant, but which I so was soon to study. Some 15 years later, I had uh, assembled a library very like the one in the dream. And there you see a picture of his alchemy library that he assembled in his home in Kusnacht. It's home in Kusnacht, if I can show you a picture of it, there. That's the home that he built in Kusnacht. This is the path leading up to the front door. Above the front door is the famous uh, inscription of vocatus atque non vocatus deus adoret, called or not called, God is present. Uh, and it was in that house, he raised his family and collected this quite magnificent alchemy library which it turned out to be, uh, in the long run, a world-class collection of alchemical texts. And it is still housed in that library in his, in his home uh, and is uh, available there to scholars occasionally who come by and want to look at something. But for scholars who don't, can't manage to get there, uh, that library has been digitized and put online and you can find it at this uh, internet address that you see on the screen right now. Uh, there's also a very fine alchemy website, which you can find almost everything about alchemy that you'd want to know. Um, and um, if you want to look at Jung's collection page by page and see what he uh, noted in the margins and so on, what he underlined, and, uh, you can actually find that online today. It's quite amazing to, to see that. Uh, if you're really interested in alchemy and Jung's work on alchemy, you can go there. Now, these are some of the books that are in his library. Uh, there you see on the right side um, the um, mark that he put in his books that tells you this book belongs to C.G. Jung. Uh, and on the left side, you see uh, a symbol of the, uh, I guess, the family of the author of the, of the book. Uh, here's another book uh, that Jung collected. This was one of the early books that he found. Actually, he went to a bookseller, he said, in Munich and told him uh, that if he came across any books on alchemy to send them to him. Uh, and soon books started appearing in the, uh, in the mail. And he said he got a book uh, shortly after he uh, became interested and went to the Munich bookseller. And he looked at it, paged through it, looked at the pictures, couldn't make heads or tails of it, and put it down, looking at it occasionally for about two years before he really got, uh, let himself get involved in the study of it. Here you see another a picture from one of his alchemy books with some Hebrew writing uh, as well. And the Euroboros uh, 
image of the Ouroboros and the philosophical tree. And um, he um, gradually uh, led himself into the study of, of alchemy. Uh, he described it quite carefully in Memories, Dreams, Reflections as a, as a process that began with um, uh, actually his first exposure to, to alchemy had been quite a few years earlier um, in the work of a man named Silber, uh, a psychoanalyst who wrote a book on alchemy uh, around 1912, Herbert Silber. And Jung read the book uh, and it didn't interest him very much at that time. And he says it's because the book was based on late alchemy works, probably from the 18th or 19th century. Um, and that uh, they were very Gothic and, and uh, surrealistic. And he, he thought it was silly. He said he was actually he uses the word silly. Uh, but he uh, did like silver and he thought maybe it was onto something, but it didn't really interest him enough. And so he put that whole thing aside. He did a lot of work on mythology, on Gnosticism, on other Eastern religions and so on. And it was, wasn't until about 1930 that he began a serious study of alchemy. First kind of paging through it, looking through it, and then gradually discovering that there was something really interesting there. This is a, a book that he writes about quite extensively in his late work Mysterium Conjunctionis, this book by Abraham Eliezer, Uraltis Chemisches, uh, whatever that word is, I can't read it. It's an uh, old German script. Um, but this is uh, actually written in German. A lot of the alchemy texts were written in Latin. Um, and uh, there you see the alchemist standing on a pedestal holding a vase in his right hand. Inside the vase, you see a Euroboric salamander and flowers coming out of the vase. It was pictures like this that kind of began to interest Jung. Um, and he says that it was when he um, got a hold of this book, the Rosarium Philosophorum, uh, a couple of years after he began his collection and really started reading it. It has a lot of interesting pictures in it. Um, uh, that he began to realize um, that certain phrases kept repeating themselves or were repeated in the text. And in this picture, you see one of them, salve et coagula. That means dissolve and coagulate or dissolve and Re, uh, reintegrate. And he went through the text, he said, and he started underlying, underlining the words uh, that were repeated. Um, and then he began making a, an alchemical uh, dictionary for himself. <clears throat> so he would write down a, a phrase or a word like lapis or um, um, our gold, our, um, uh, uh, our salve et coagula, or um, non vulgi, the unvulgar, not vulgar gold, terms like this that he found uh, um, repeated in the texts. Um, and every time he came across a, that word in a text, he would write down the sentence that it appeared in. And so over a period of time, he collected uh, quite a number of sentences that in which the word lapis occurred, for instance. Um, and then doing a kind of comparative study, he began to tease out what it was, what the meaning of this term was for the alchemists. Um, and eventually, it struck him, he says, that they were his brothers. The alchemists were talking about things that he uh, found very familiar uh, to his own experience. And uh, he eventually came to look on them as his familiar uh, predecessors. And I think it was very comforting to him during the years from 
early 1930. He says he, he worked on, on the alchemy text for more than a decade. Well, actually, I would say probably 25 years until he published his final work on alchemy, Mysterium, in Yonsionis, 1955. Uh, 25 years of intensive work uh, with the mind of the alchemists. And he did a very thorough job of it. Uh, but I think it gave him great comfort to study these texts during those terrible, turbulent years in, in Europe. When you think uh, what began to happen in Europe in the early 1930s, in Germany and Italy and uh, Russia, uh, all of which was very much in the news. He was very familiar with it. He had many contacts in these countries and um, really felt that the world was falling apart around him. Um, terrible things happening in the political world and the economic world, financial world, Great Depression and everything. Uh, sitting in his library, reading these books, letting himself go deeply into these texts, I think gave him some hope and comfort uh, that he could be with the mind of companions. And what he found so companionable about them was one of the things was that they were also heretics. <laughs> they were not <laughs> conventional people. They were not conventional Christians. They lived sort of on the margins of Christianity. Some of them were Jewish uh, alchemists. And uh, at a later point, he found uh, remarkable similarities between the alchemists and the Kabbalists, the Kabbalah. He started studying the Kabbalah also in relation to alchemy. Uh, and so in these heretical traditions, he found his, his company, his uh, band of uh, cohorts. And in one dream that he tells in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, it's on page 203, uh, he, um, uh, it's a very interesting dream and quite paradoxical. He says that he was uh, traveling uh, uh, in Italy and he ended up in Verona, um, coming down through, uh, it was actually still wartime, although this was not wartime anymore. First, he's thinking of the First World War, which ended some 15 years earlier or 10, 10 years earlier. Uh, and coming down through Austria ends up in Verona and is with a companion and they enter a large building, a manor house with a grand courtyard inside. He says it was like the Louvre, you know, so, uh, inner courtyard surrounded by uh, structures, building. And the coachman and himself drove in through a gate and there was a sec second gate at the far end and suddenly the gates all slammed shut and he was locked and enclosed in this building and the peasant, he says, leaped down from his seat, he was driving the coach and exclaimed, now we are caught in the 17th century. And Jung thought to himself, well, what's that? But what is there to do about it now? We shall be caught for years. Then the consoling thought came to me, someday, years from now, I shall get out again. Well, it took him about 25 years to get out. Uh, he spent a long time in this world of alchemy. And as he says, the 17th century is very significant in alchemy. And it was more or less the high point of uh, classical alchemy. Here's another alchemy text supposedly written by Albertus Magnus, um, a great uh, Christian theologian of the 13th century, uh, who also delved into alchemy. And there's another, the amphitheater of the wise, uh, Christian Kabbalistic, you see, um, a combination of Kabbalism, Kabbalah and alchemy. Here's another book from Jung's library. You can see what an amazing collection he had. And this is, I believe, Gerhard Dorn, 
Oh, what happened there? There we are. Uh, the amphitheater. I need to get back to my picture. There we are. Now, I want to show you some, just a list of the references. If you go through Jung's uh, collected works um, and look for the references to all the alchemists, you come across many, many names. And what I've done is jot down these names and show you their time period. Um, these are the important figures to Jung. These were his companions. And he studied these texts uh, meticulously and over a long period of time. So from the first century of the Common Era, you can see the famous Her Hermes Trismegistus, uh, who wrote, uh, supposedly, at least according to tradition, the Emerald Tablets. And uh, that's one of the basic texts of alchemy. And Maria Prophetisa, to whom Jung refers to over and over again in his writings, uh, because she talks about the process of movement from one to four. And then a figure named Comarios. Again, Jung refers to him over and over again. These are the, the um, figures who kind of laid down the foundations of Western alchemy. The word alchemy, incidentally, is an Arab word, alchemia. Uh, and the Arabs uh, brought... Um, a lot of the Greek texts uh, into, into Europe where they were retranslated into Latin or rediscovered. Um, and so the word alchemy really means chemistry, but it's a, it's a Arabic word for chemistry, alchemia. Uh, and nobody knows the ultimate origins of alchemy, um, to my knowledge at least. I think there are theories about it that it might have had to do with early forms of metallurgy um, that uh, um, um, blacksmiths, you know, Hephaestus type characters in mythology uh, were uh, working with metals and uh, merging different kinds of metals, trying to strengthen metals, making weapons with metals and so on, using fires to melt metals, uh, and perhaps discovering all kinds of strange properties within the metals and being able to change one metal to another kind by blending them together and creating amalgams and so on. Uh, or another theory is, maybe another source is um, the Egyptian uh, procedures of mummifying uh, corpses and um, immortalizing them. Because there is a, a strong uh, theme in alchemy of attaining immortality through the opus, through the work of alchemy. You can attain immortality for your soul. And this is also the, uh, um, a theme in The Secret of the Golden Flower that was Jung's first serious exposure to alchemy. It was Chinese alchemy. And um, in uh, the, one of the titles of that is uh, The Achievement of Immortality Through the Work of, uh, of Meditation. Um, and that's the secret of the golden flower, that if you do this meditation, you will be able to um, create a golden flower or a diamond body. Uh, and that is something that is incorruptible and immortal. So the attainment to immortality, also to good health, uh, um, was, a, was a theme of the alchemists. They, sought to create what they called an alexapharmacon. That was a substance that could heal all illnesses. So it's a combination of healing, producing longevity, and as we shall see, and what Jung was mostly interested in was not the making of gold, literal gold, but the making of psychological gold or creating a integrated self through a long process of um, many procedures and stages and steps. And then you go on from the first century after you get these really fundamental archetypal figures. Nobody knows if they ever really lived or existed. Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great Hermes, Maria 
prophetisa, who was that? Nobody knows exactly. But these are quasi-mystical figures who left behind a great legacy and are constantly referred to by Jung and by the alchemists. Kumarios, another one. And then you come to the second century Pseudodemocritus, fourth century Zosimos of Panopolis. Um, and he was a very important figure for Jung. Jung wrote a whole essay on Zosimos because it has to do with dismemberment and again, the attainment of, uh, through a process of transmutations, the attainment of immortality or a subtle body or um, a diamond body. Um, and so um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, images of uh, uh, transformation are contained in the texts of Zosimos. Arrhenius, uh, 5th century, Jung refers to quite often. Khalid is an is a, um, Arab alchemist from the 7th century that Jung refers to very often. Geber, from where the word from whom the word gibberish comes from, gibberish, <laughs> alchemy is gibberish, uh, nonsense. Geber uh, from the eighth century, eighth century, wrote a very important work on alchemy, De Alchemia. Um, and the 10th century senior, uh, again, uh, a figure that Jung refers to over and over again. Then the 12th century, Artefios, not a very important figure. 13th, you get some very important uh, writers in alchemy, Albertus Magnus, who I mentioned before, uh, and Arnold de Villanova, who wrote the Phil uh, Rosium Philosophorum. And uh, we'll see a lot more of the Rosarium Philosophorum as we go on in this series, if we do. Uh, that's the work that Jung based his great uh, uh, essay on transference on the Rosarium Philosophorum, Psychology of the Transference and chose 10 pictures from the series of 20 to illustrate various stages of, uh, of the alchemical-like uh, process of transformation in uh, analysis. Roger Bacon, very important figure in science, and Raymond Lully, an English alchemist that Jung refers to quite often. 14th century, only one figure that, he, that Jung refers to. And then the 15th century, um, some important figures, George Ripley, the Cantalina, Jung comments on extensively in Mysterium Cunionsionis. Uh, Marsilio Ficino, of course, who's a very well-known Renaissance figure. And um, Agrippa von Nettelsheim, Jung quotes quite often. And then the 16th century, you're coming really to the height of alchemy um, remember Jung is, is um, trapped or imprisoned in the 17th century, which he called, considers the height of alchemy, but I would say the 16th century probably even exceeds the 17th century. And here the figures are very well known if you've read Jung's works on alchemy at all, uh, or read in this kind of literature, you'll run across these names over and over again. Jakob Böhme, who is so important to William Blake, and to the whole uh, counter countercultural tradition and the mystical tradition in the West, Alcott Bema is a very important figure for Jung. John D, an English alchemist that Jung refers to, to Hoagland. Uh, Gerhard Dorn, uh, the last chapter of Mysterium Jungsianus is devoted to uh, uh, some reflections of Gerhard Dorn on the stages of the alchemical process that Jung does a marvelous job in, in uh, relating those to stages of consciousness and the growth of consciousness. Um, Heinrich Conrad Kunrat, again, very well known alchemist, Melchior, early at six, and Paracelsus. Jung gave two important lectures on Paracelsus in the early 1940s when Paracelsus. Uh, 500th birthday or death day, I guess it was birthday. Oh, it looks like death day, 1541. Uh, so in uh, 1941, yeah, 1941, 400th birthday of, Par or 400th death day of Paracelsus. 
uh, Jung was asked to give um, lectures in Einsiedel, where Paracelsus was resident. Uh, he lived in Einsiedel, traveled around Europe quite a bit, but he was from Einsiedel. It's called the Wild Ass from Einsiedel. Uh, journeyed down into Zurich, and there's a plaque on the on the uh, wall of the Hotel zum Storchen in Zurich, right on the river, uh, that says Paracelsus slept here. Uh, so Paracelsus is a Swiss um, alchemist, physician, philosopher, theologian that Jung became very, very interested in and found very important for his own work, especially in linking uh, psychology to religion. And um, he refers quite often to his essay on Paracelsus um, in that regard. And then you have Solomon Trismosin, who also is, who wrote the Splendor Solace, which is a beautiful, uh, colorful text that um, Joseph Henderson uh, was very fond of and commented on, discovered beautiful plates of the Splendor Solace at the uh, British Museum when he was a student in London and uh, made copies and uh, many, many years later, in the 1990s, with a student of his in San Francisco, uh, published a book on the Splendor Solace. Um, then you have the 17th century, and this is where Jung says he was trapped. So he was trapped with Michael Meyer and Christian Rosenkreutz. Uh, but I think uh, actually the uh, figures that he prefers uh, are not 17th century. You can see in the 18th century already the frequency, the number of alchemists is declining. Uh, it really peaks in the 16th century. Uh, the greatest of them uh, lived in the 16th century. Now the 17th century, science and alchemy are beginning to come apart. Science is really beginning to uh, form a ground of its own apart from philosophy and religion. And the 17th century is really the turning point into the enlightenment and modern science in the West. And so this division between chemistry and alchemy took place uh, in the 17th century uh, and alchemy thereafter became more a philosophical and quasi-religious preoccupation and less a chemical preoccupation. So the material and the mental aspects of it split. And what Jung appreciated so much was that the alchemists were working with materia and hadn't split the spirit from matter. And they were able to work with matter in a spiritual way. And he thought we could learn a lot from that. Uh, and certainly ecology today is very much oriented in that direction, finding the spirit in matter, letting matter speak to us, relating to the material world in a, in a more conscious way, in a psychological way, uh, and recognizing that there is spirit in all of nature. So, until the 17th century, there wasn't this great division between matter and spirit, now, certainly not in the work of the alchemists. And uh, Jung saw it as a great loss, certainly to alchemy, that this, uh, this occurred uh, after the 17th century when alchemy really went into uh, a whole different direction and became uh, quite abstract and philosophical rather than any longer working with uh, materials in the laboratory. The, there's famous alchemy picture uh, with two plates. On, on one plate, you see the alchemist sitting in a library studying the books. In the other plate, on the other side, in the other room, you see them uh, stripped down to the loincloths, working with a, in a, with a furnace, sweating it out, working with materials. and the, idea was you, to go back and forth between the library and the laboratory. And Jung also, of course, associates that to uh, analysis and psychological work that we go back and forth between studying and practicing, practicing on ourselves, practicing with our patients. 
and so on, and studying the books and um, deepening our uh, theoretical and philosophical understanding while staying very much in contact with the material of the psyche and not letting psychology just become an academic department. So that's why Jung left off with the university uh, and he saw that where psychology was going in the universities, of course, was in a very academic uh, direction and leaving the psyche behind. He said it's psychology without the psyche because the psyche is rooted in matter and the body, the instincts, all of that. And uh, the psychology of the universities doesn't have so much to do with that. Um, and then in the 18th century, you find uh, Abraham Eliezer, the Jew, uh, it's uncertain whether he really was Jewish uh, or just claimed to be for some reason, but he does bring uh, Jewish philosophy and, and theology and especially the, the um, Kabbalah into his work. And Jung comments uh, extensively on a passage from Abraham Eliezer in his late work, uh, Asterium Kinyotzionis. And so he was very fond of uh, Eliezer's work, even though he's quite late, 18th century. And then in the 19th century, Jung looked upon Goethe as an alchemist, a modern alchemist, and he said that alchemy really formed his, the basis of his connection with Goethe. You know, there was a rumor in his family that his grandfather was illegitimate, illegitimate son of Goethe, that there was a, a kind of blood connection with Goethe. His mother gave him Goethe's Faust to read when he was a very young boy, or a teenager, 14 years old or so, and he was fascinated. He lived with Goethe all his life. And he saw that Goethe, uh, in, in his work Faust, really was engaged in a, in a kind of uh, alchemical process. And uh, he quotes Goethe in this chapter of the work as saying, Faust was my main work. My main work was about Faust. Um, and it's, it's very moving. Uh, I can find that passage. Jung speaks of um, his connection to, to Goethe because he says, my main work uh, was discovering the secrets of the personality, the secrets of the psyche. Uh, and what he saw in Goethe was that as Goethe elaborated his story, he was a famous poet and a, a writer, but he became himself engaged as though it were a kind of act of imagination in the story. And the story that he elaborated pretty much to the end of his life. He, he finished Faust part two very close to his, the end of his life, really is the story of his own inner development. The way the Red Book is the story of Jung's inner development in his middle period. Um, and so Jung felt great kinship with Goethe. And so you see how he now traces his lineage through these alchemists, through Goethe back to Eliezer, back to uh, Michael Meyer, and so on, back into um, the tradition of the alchemists. Now, on this uh, slide, you can see Jung's alchemical writings. I've just gone through the uh, collected works and, and put them in chronological order so that you can see uh, uh, how much attention he did give to his alchemical work. If you take the collected works as a whole, uh, there are 18 volumes. Three of those volumes um, are related to, are directly related to alchemy, volumes 12, 13, and 14. So a good percentage, you could say, um, three eighteenths uh, are devoted to uh, directly to alchemy. Now there are other essays in the collected works that also use alchemy quite a lot so uh, and refer to alchemy. So you could say that the, the veins of alchemy or the roots uh, spread out 
throughout uh, much of the collected works after Jung discovered alchemy. So almost everything written after 1930 uh, has something, some reference to alchemy. He began in 1929 with a commentary on the secret of the golden flower, which is Chinese alchemy. Um, and then, uh, as I told you, he starts buying the alchemy books, building up his library, it takes a couple of years to get going. Uh, and then he starts studying them intensively and making his, his uh, dictionary of alchemical terms. So by the time 1936 rolls around, um, he uh, writes, uh, uh, gives a lecture first at Eranos, um, and then uh, continues to work on this uh, individual dream symbolism in relation to alchemy, a, a series of dreams that uh, were given to him by uh, a colleague, a man who came to him for therapy that he referred to a student of his, Wolfgang Pauli, as the uh, physicist. And Pauli at one point gave him a series of dreams and Jung looked at them and he um, uh, discovered by uh, studying them carefully and looking at the development of the symbols and the images in them, that they showed uh, a process that he could relate to an alchemical process of transformation. And so he was very fascinated by this connection. And he comments on about a hundred dreams and images and active imaginations of Pauli's uh, in this 1936 Aranos lecture. He refers to this uh, dream series uh, a number of times elsewhere. And then he puts it into a book uh, that he published in 1944, Psychology and Alchemy. It's part two of Psychology and Alchemy. That's 1936. 1937, he gave an Aronos paper. Uh, the Aronos Conference is held annually in Ascona in August, uh, featuring uh, lecturers, scholars from all over the world, world famous figures. Um, in an attempt to get a dialogue going among the world religions, and Jung represented psychology. So Jung was a constant presence in, uh, at the Ernos lectures from 1933 when they began until he became too old and ill to attend anymore after 1952 or so. Um, and um, he gave some of his most important papers the original versions of the papers at Aranos. He would then go home, rewrite the papers for publication in the Aranos Jahrbuch, uh, and then often take that same paper and elaborate still further and publish it in still yet another book. So when he gets around to putting this, uh, these two lectures together in, in Collected Works 12, Psychology and Alchemy, um, they are quite extensively revised and, and uh, uh, filled out uh, from what they were originally as Aranos lectures. So in 1937, he gave this lecture, Religious Ideas and Alchemy, which is much more, well, much more than religious ideas and alchemy. It's a, it's a very, very uh, important introductory text to Jung's understanding of alchemy. Um, and that becomes part three of uh, volume 12. Then in 1937 also, he publishes a, uh, an essay on the visions of Zosimos, the um, third century, third, fourth century alchemist, in collected works published now in collected works 13. 1942, as I told you, uh, he was invited to give lectures in Einsiedeln in 1941 on the 400th anniversary of Paracelsus' death, um, published in 1942, Paracelsus as a Spiritual Phenomenon. 1943, uh, this wonderful paper, The Spirit Mercurius, that was originally delivered as an Aranos lecture. This is the middle of the war now, mind you. So Aranos is greatly reduced during those years. Only Swiss could attend because Switzerland was cut off from the rest of Europe and people could come and go. Uh, but there were enough scholars in Switzerland to keep it going at a minimum uh, 
level of attendance and so on during the war years. So 1943, the spirit Mercurius. And this figure, Mercurius, is really the central spiritual element in all of alchemy. He's the spirit of nature. And as Jung writes about him, he corresponds to uh, the spirit of Christ from above, the heavenly spirit. Mercurius is the spirit of nature, the spirit of the mother. And uh, Jung brings those two figures together in a very interesting set of reflections about the relation of alchemy to Christian mysteries. Um, then in 1942, he writes the introduction uh, to uh, collected works 12, Psychology and Alchemy, the introduction to the religious and psychological problems of alchemy. Uh, so 1944, he's finally finished the, uh, put to, putting together what we call the volume we call Psychology and Alchemy now, Collected Works 12. And it is published uh, in Switzerland in 1944. That is the first work that was translated into English in the Collected Works series. Because uh, when, after the war, the Collected Works got underway uh, under the sponsorship of the um, Aronos Foundation in New York, uh, funded by Mary Mellon. The Mellons gave the money for it uh, and uh, hired uh, the translator Hull, RFC Hull, to begin translating the, Jung's work into what would become the collected works. There were three editors involved uh, in making the selection of papers and organizing the collected works, and they decided to publish this one first. Uh, so the first uh, uh, introduction of Jung into the English-speaking world, as far as the collected works goes, at any rate, was his, his work on alchemy. And the reason they did that was that there was, uh, once it had been published in German, the word got out of, about how interesting and how important this work was. And the uh, translator and the editors felt they wanted to get that one into English first, because there was kind of a clamoring for it among Jung's followers and students in America and, uh, and England and elsewhere in the English speaking world. Then in 1945, just at the end of the war, another Aronos paper, uh, a philosophical tree, which is uh, a, an image of the, the individuation process as Jung interprets it. It's an important symbol in alchemy. Um, 1946, the psychology of the transference uh, which is based on the Rosarium Philosophorum, um, the, the first work that really drew uh, Jung into alchemy. And here he relates it to clinical material. His other works are not so directly related to clinical material. They're more related to archetypal studies and um, symbolism. And now he's bringing alchemy directly into relation with the clinic and with uh, analytic practice. And so he's using uh, an alchemy text, classic alchemy text, to talk about the transformative relationship uh, that uh, he had written about in earlier essays, where he talks about uh, the four stages of, of uh, psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, uh, the fourth stage being transformation, uh, where the, both the patient and the doctor are equally affected, equally uh, drawn into a process, and both are changed, and something new emerges between them as a result of the work. And so that he sees um, symbolized very graphically and powerfully in the Rosarium Philosophorum, that process of mutual transformation. Um, and it's, it's one of Jung's uh, great works on, uh, on analysis, on clinical uh, process. Um, many people don't understand it and can't read it. It's not easy to read. You, you need quite a lot of background in um, analytical psychology and in psychoanalysis and in the process 
in order to begin to grasp what Jung is driving at. But he's talking about a very deep process of, of transformation. And then his final great work, really his magnum opus with regard at least to alchemy, volume 14 of Eclected Works, Mysterium Conjunctionis. And he says about this that he worked on it for over 10 years. Well, probably even more because um, psychology of the transference uh, was supposed to be a part of it. Um, and he broke that out uh, and made it into a separate book in 1946. So he published Mysterium Canonicionis in 1954. Probably he started working on it in 1944 or a little earlier. And he says that the stimulus for it was uh, a book that had been written on Goethe's Faust by uh, a colleague of his, um, where is his name? Carl uh, Carini. Yes, Carl Carini was a mythologist from Hungary who came to Aranos in 1942, I believe, and sat out the rest of the war because of what was happening in Hungary, uh, in Switzerland. And then he relocated to Switzerland. And he and, and Jung actually wrote a book together in the late 1930s, I think 1938, a book called uh, The Science of Mythology. And Jung contributed two essays, and Carini contributed a couple of essays to that. Jung wrote about the child archetype and the quarry. And, um, and then Carini gave, I think it was at Aranos, and then he published a book on the Aegean Festival in Goethe's Faust Part Two. And Jung wanted to write a commentary on that book. And as he got more and more into it, he realized that it was really uh, growing uh, way beyond a commentary on what Carini had done. And he wanted to uh, make it into a significant work of his own. And really, he poured uh, all of his studies of alchemy into that final work. Um, right beside him, sitting beside him throughout this period from about 1935 on, you have to see his Soror Mystica because uh, Jung really was responsible for all his works, but he had some help and he had some inspiration. And that Soror Mystica was Mary Louise von Franz, who first met Jung in the 1930s as an 18 year old and began uh, analytic work with him uh, when she went to the university. And while she was at the university and she didn't have any money to pay for the sessions, she uh, gave, uh, she, she worked for Jung uh, to pay off her bill and she translated uh, from the Latin uh, for Jung, even though he could read Latin very well and look things up and found sources and track things down. She was an excellent scholar and she wrote her doctoral dissertation on a medieval Latin text. Uh, she has a doctorate in, in uh, Latin, basically medieval Latin. Um, and she is sitting right beside him. And I, I imagine them in conversation and dialogue quite a lot about these texts. What does this passage mean? How do you interpret that? How would you translate that phrase? And when he gets around to publishing Ion in 1950, um, she, Mary Louise von Franz at the same time publishes a companion volume to Ion on uh, the dream of Perpetua, Perpetua, medieval saint. And when Jung publishes Mysterium Conjunctionis, she publishes a companion volume to that. It was a three volume set. Jung's Mysterium Conjunctionis was two volumes, and hers was a third volume on a medieval alchemy text uh, that's been attributed to Thomas Aquinas. Um, but one isn't sure who wrote it, actually. But uh, she is sitting right beside Jung. And um, this Mysterium Conjunctionis is all about the coming together of the masculine and the feminine. Uh, 
not in a physical sexual sense per se, but in a attitudinal sense or in a, let's say, in a much larger sense of uh, two principles of uh, two ways of thinking, two ways of approaching the world. Sometimes Jung would speak of it as logos and eros, uh, uh, and um, which he already did in the Red Book when he meets Elijah and Salome and reflects on what they mean to him. He associates Elijah with logos uh, type thinking, uh, philosophical thinking, spiritual thinking, and uh, Salome with eros or feeling thinking, a different kind of mentality, thinking with feeling rather than thinking with logic. Um, and Jung felt that the patriarchal traditions of the West, uh, patriarchal traditions that come out of the biblical tradition, all three of them, are heavily uh, oriented toward logos, law, um, father, father archetype, uh, God the father, and have not managed to integrate uh, the feminine side of the of the Godhead, as, as Jung understands it, the Sophia side. So uh, Jung felt that was one of the great lacks in Christianity, that Sophia uh, had not been integrated enough into the picture of the Godhead, so that she might be around, but she isn't a co-equal figure. Um, and he felt that the alchemists were working on this problem that had been, uh, had been to some extent worked on by Christianity following uh, the, book of, the book of Job when Yahweh is forced to recollect his wisdom and his omniscience and his arrows side in, in the figure of Sophia. But then the Christian dispensation uh, fell back into a splitting off of Logos from Eros uh, to the extent that uh, uh, these two principles were not really reconciled, but one was placed above the other, even though some advance perhaps had been made over the earlier, more strongly patriarchal tradition. And Jung felt that the alchemists were continuing that work of uniting the opposites, especially the masculine and the feminine, but also good and evil, uh, so as to create a, uh, a symbol of, of uh, maximum wholeness in their ultimate uh, uh, um, uh, product that they would sometimes refer as the lapis, the stone, or the gold, uh, as a kind of uh, union of uh, uh, sulfur and salt, which is the way they talked about the masculine and the feminine, through Mercurius. Mercurius is the medium, brings together the masculine and the feminine to produce the um, rebus, as it's shown at, in the 10th picture of the Rosarium in Jung's um, commentary. So those are Jung's works on um, alchemy. Um, before we close, um, I would like to leave a couple of minutes at least for um, questions and discussion. Um, but I want to just mention a number of themes that were important for Jung in alchemy and then describe briefly what the rest of the series would look like if we continue to do a series. Um, important for Jung was that alchemy describes and shows very clearly an archetypal process. Jung had been working on archetypal images, archetypal uh, figures prior to his study of alchemy uh, through mythology and, and uh, research into religious symbolism and so on. But alchemy emphasizes process. And 
Jung wanted to put an archetypal basis under the process of transformation or what he would call individuation. And that he found in alchemy, the emphasis on process, extremely important, and the emphasis on transformation, of moving from one state of material uh, configuration to another one, from uh, prima materia to the lapis or the gold, and the uh, stages of transformation along the way, describing them very carefully. And then the theme of separation and union, which is very important, uh, separatio and coagulatio, very important for thinking about the individuation process, various stages, stages in a process with a goal. And uh, this, uh, the, uh, uh, the stages with a goal uh, is a way of talking about the opus, what the, what the alchemists spoke of as the opus of alchemy. It's a process that is aimed towards something. It's not just a process going endlessly in circles or spirals or whatever, it's going toward a goal. And the goal is defined in alchemy. And Jung was very interested in relating that to uh, the individuation process. And then of course, this factor of historical continuity, when Jung discovered the alchemists, um, they were so important for him personally, but they also linked his modern depth psychology to deep historical traditions, uh, all the way back to the Egyptians. And so he felt that he was putting depth psychology on a solid footing, uh, because as he says in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, you can't have a depth psychology without history, without deep history. You can have a psychology of consciousness without history, but you can't have a depth psychology without history. And so he felt it very important to create a history, a linkage, and a lineage for depth psychology. And that he found in alchemy, the link back to ancient traditions, uh, such as Gnosticism and um, uh, early primitive forms of religiosity and, and uh, reflection and development that even precede history, written history. So historical continuity was very important and alchemy was for him the link. If we continue uh, this series, here's what I suggest uh, as topics for the series. I put five up there. Today would be the introduction. Um, the next one, and each of these would be connected with a text. And as a seminar, uh, one would want all the seminar participants to read the text and then we could discuss passages in the text. The first one would be actually the second after the introduction, alchemical images as states of mind. Uh, so for instance, uh, Negredo, Beto, uh, Rubedo, states of mind, and all the alchemical images have to do with uh, psychological uh, moments in our, that we can recognize in our own psychological process. Secondly, alchemy is a model for psychological and spiritual work. This would be focusing on alchemy as opus, as the work. The third, an alchemical process is shown in a dream series. We would look at the dream series that Jung comments on from Wolfgang Pauli. And then alchemy as a guide for transformation and analysis. There we would look at the text on the, on the psychology of the transference. And finally, alchemy as a map for stages of psychological and spiritual development. Um, so that's what I would propose as a series. And as Steve said at the, at the start, you can um, vote and make your wishes known if you would like to continue with this or we can let it rest after this introduction. I would like to leave you with the impression though that alchemy was very important for Jung, for the late Jung. Uh, in fact, you could almost define the late Jung as the alchemical Jung, the Jung with alchemy locked into that uh, 17th century uh, or 18th century, um, 17th, yeah, 17th century um, castle and uh, writing to us from that position and also writing as a modern man.
So he had one foot in the 17th century and earlier and one foot out. But what he really wanted to do was to bring spirit and matter back together again and uh, go back to where, to the point where it separated in alchemy and try to link us back into the feeling of a unus mundus, a feeling of linkage with the uh, with the material world, the physical world, the natural world. And we're a part of all of that. And our psyche reflects that. Well, thank you so much, Marie. That was a, a marvelous and review of alchemy. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, we do have a number of questions and I'll go ahead and start talking about some of those. Um, meanwhile, in the question pane, I see number of votes to continue for the alchemy. Um, in fact, go ahead and, and type in you know, if you have thoughts about or not, but I'm already you know, seeing in the, the question box, but a few people would like to continue. And, and I'm one of those. I think that's been a marvelous you know, talk today and would love to keep going with that. Um, we've got some time. Let me ask some of the questions that have come in. And there's a number, so I apologize to those of you who I won't be able to ask. Let me go with this one first. Uh, Murray, how much do you use the concepts of alchemy clinically as you're working with analysants? And how much do you directly share these concepts with them? Thoughts about that? Uh, uh, one has, in, in clinical work, one always, uh, uh, I follow Jung's guidance on this, leave at the door everything you know and just be fresh and open with the patient as they come. But of course, uh, the more you know about alchemy, uh, the more the more I've studied it, the more relevant it seems, especially in interpreting certain moods and, and states of mind, states of feeling, and dream images to some extent. I wouldn't say I, I use it on a daily basis or with everybody by a long stretch of the imagination, uh, but I, um, I often have it in the back of my mind. It helps to orient me. And I would share it with, especially with, I work with a number of students in training analysis and they're studying the material at the same time. So we have a kind of uh, uh, mutual appreciation and association with some of the alchemical images. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I don't hear you, Steve. Okay, there you go. I, I tried to mute, so there's no feedback with it. Uh, a couple other questions. Uh, one is sort of a simple one. Uh, will Murray Stein be substantially involved in the alchemical uh, chemical series? And the answer is yes. Murray Stein will indeed be quite involved. And you'll be uh, either hosting the majority or kind of co-hosting with others, I'm assuming. Then here's an interesting one from Paul. Uh, Paul Pines asks, the place of Newton as an alchemist, even though even through Pauli, uh, was this address or was that an issue? Pauli, I guess, and or Newton as alchemists. Thoughts with that? I think I think it was discovered. Uh, Newton's alchemical writings were discovered after Jung's death. And Jung never mentions Newton, and I don't know that Newton's alchemical writings really have been published even to date. I mean, I, I understand there were boxes and trunks full of them uh, found at some point. I think in the seventies. And a scholar from Northwestern University wrote a book about Newton's alchemy. Um, but uh, I don't think that was known. Pauli died in the 1950s, Jung died in 1961, so they didn't know about it. Uh, but that would be a very interesting study for a Jungian to take on if the um, alchemical writings that Newton produced are, uh, are have been published. Probably they're online somewhere. I haven't looked into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a fascinating question. We, we have a, a group here in Asheville at our, our practice. And Steve, if you're there, uh, go and open up the webcam uh, if there are any questions. And if there's not, you can just come on briefly and, and uh, just uh, give a comment. Uh, yep, there's Steve. And can somebody go back to the front door and turn the lights on briefly? It's be in the dark. <laughs> yeah, they, they have it darkened so they can see you better. Um, oops, they just cut out. Uh, well, Steve, if you get the webcam back on, go ahead and turn the lights on. There we go. There you are. Yeah. Any questions from Asheville? Make sure to unmute yourself, too. 
are being offered. Um, I would just want to suggest and, and hope for clinical applications, particularly for those of us who are clinicians working as uh, counselors, social workers, psychiatrists in the area, and you know, many of us are very interested in our clinical practices and the applications at these grassroots levels are uh, very, very meaningful to us. So if that naturally can be incorporated, we're appreciative. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much. I think uh, uh, if you look at the series, it's very much oriented in that direction. So um, I think, uh, for instance, um, the dream series, uh, alch uh, the alchemical process is shown perhaps in, in dreams, dream work, uh, certainly in uh, reflections on transference and counter-transference, stages of development. All these have strong clinical connections. So that would definitely be a an important part of the series, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions from Asheville Friends of Young before I close with uh, one, or two uh, one or two emails? emails. Yeah, I've got a question for Murray. Um, I, I find it fascinating that there was such an incredible wealth of alchemical work done in medieval Europe, and you've done a marvelous job of sort of summarizing that for us. But uh, what interests me, and I was wondering if you could comment on this, is Jung's initial introduction into alchemy actually comes through the, the Chinese alchemical work. Uh, it, does he comment later on on the archetypal dimension? Here it is showing up in, in Europe, as you mentioned, it began in, at least in, in the West, it began in Egypt. It, it was shared to Europe through the Arabs, but Jung's, Jung's initial uh, exposure is through China. Does he comment on the on the archetypal nature yes. of, of yes. yes, yes, very yes, much. Yes. I mean, that's that's why that's what fascinated him so much about that text, that, and that it came from so far away. Obviously, <clears throat> as far as one knows, at least I, I don't know what the uh, you know, what the geographical and historical connections might have been between China and, and the West at that time, but very minimal. And so he concluded that it was an archetypal process that he'd experienced in his own work and some of his patients. And then when he got into further into the study of alchemy, um, he was really uh, uh, convinced that the process that the alchem alchemists were uh, working with and studying uh, was uh, uh, a, an archetypal one that you'd find across culturally and also in contemporary uh, people's um, unconscious material. And that's what interested him so much about Pauli's dreams. Here's a young man, a scientist, very uh, high level intellectual, becomes a Nobel Prize winner some years later, uh, teaching at the ETH in Zurich, and in his dreams, also alchemical type themes. So Jung identifies those in the dreams of a contemporary scientific young man in China and in medieval alchemy. So that's how he went about uh, substantiating that uh, archetypal motifs um, exist. He has a theory of archetypes, it's a model, and then he looks for evidence. And those are bits and pieces of evidence that he finds and, and concludes that the process that is uh, represented in the alchemical opus is an archetypal one. He, he writes about that explicitly. Yes. I'm muted. He writes about that explicitly. Yes. I just had one uh, addition. Thank you, Murray. Um, uh, I have received several ballots here to uh, vote yes for continuing the series. <laughs> yeah, outstanding. And I have as well. So I think there's about 10 to 12 or so in the Asheville Friends of Young. And it sounds like that's uh, uh, very much positive. And I've been scrolling through the question you know, pane here, and, and there's quite a few comments of a lot can go forward. Um, so Murray and I can talk in the next week or two, but I, I see this as a definite moving forward, if at all possible. There was one question that popped up, which says, how often would we meet? And we're, we're looking at monthly or so. So it'd be once a month, give or take. It wouldn't be exactly on a month's schedule. 
and we would likely uh, do Saturday mornings, uh, 12 o'clock noon Eastern U.S. time, and keep it with the 90-minute format. And I like the idea of the readings. We'll have to figure out um, if those would be somehow emailed or if people need to purchase books. Uh, but we'll figure out uh, that part with Marina as well. Um, okay. So with that, it's it's we're at the, the time. So again, I apologize for the questions we couldn't answer, uh, but come back for the series. And there's no reason you can't ans ask the questions again in the series coming up. One last reminder that we're taking a break for December. So we'll be on holiday and, and with family, as most people will be. And Asheville Young Center will be back up in business January like 9th, 8th or 9th which will be uh, Lionel Corbett with the Sacred Cauldron. And then uh, San Francisco and Chicago have a couple of things they'd like to do. And of course, we'll continue the At Home at Zurich series. Uh, probably February, I think, is our target for that. And we'll, uh, we'll announce the dates and get those posted online uh, quite soon and get the final details together. So with that, thank you again, Murray. Really appreciate a wonderful talk. That was just absolutely fabulous. I know people did as well and will uh, see you in a couple months. So bye, everybody. Yeah.